friends, there is an alternative title uh, to my talk today, which is a nationalist manifesto from an na anti-national university. <laughs> okay. Um, now, uh, looking back at the last 70 years since the independence and partition of the country, one is struck by the difference between the Halkian years of freedom and our present times. The Nehruvian era saw the establishment of a secular polity, a democratic nation, and an independent economy. The Nehruvian dream was about harnessing the potential of the agricultural and industrial sector, eliminating poverty, ending parochialisms, pursuing an independent foreign policy, and building Asian solidarity. Perhaps the greatest achievement was upholding the values of secularism and democracy in a post-partition society. Partition had been accepted with great sadness, but the two-nation theory on which partition was argued and rested was soundly rejected, as was the demand that India should become a Hindu state. This is something that I will take up a little later. Gandhi's assassination, a terrible tragedy, had been followed by a ban on communal organizations, including the RSS. The achievement was all the more considerable given that the adverse circumstances which India found itself in after centuries of colonialism and the adversities of partition. It was almost like building sand dikes at high tide. Today, we seem to be moving towards a society where identities, particularly around religion and caste, increasingly prevail. An atmosphere of intolerance of the other appears to have official sanction and hence acquires legitimacy. Can we harness the legacy of the freedom struggle to counter the divisive legacy of the partition in present times? I think that is the challenge before us today. Many years ago, uh, I co-authored a book called RSS, School Texts and the Murder of Mahatma Gandhi. This book began like this. Do, I'm quoting, during the election campaign for the UP Legislative Assembly in April 2007, it was found that some audiovisual CDs were being circulated with the intention of spreading vicious communal poison. It was vicious enough for the Election Commission to order the UP government to lodge an FIR with the police against several BJP functionaries, including the national president of the party, Rajnath Singh, now our Honorable Home Minister. The BJP typically denied responsibility for it. The CDs showed Muslims pretending to be Hindus acquiring cows from quote-unquote unsuspecting Hindus and slaughtering them mercilessly. And there were elaborate footage in these CDs showing the animals being slaughtered, their throats being cut. It was so clearly meant to evoke hostility and hatred. The CDs also had uh, footage of Muslim boys abducting Hindu girls by deceit and forcibly converting them. And the CDs went on to warn uh, the audience that while Hindus produce two children, Muslims would marry five times and produce a litter. I was shocked at the word litter of 35 pups. In Hindi, the word used was pilla, and make this country into an Islamic state. Now, the above quotation from this 2008 book shows us that things have got only worse in the last 10 years. Newspapers today are replete with instances of lynching of Muslims for suspected eating of beef or purchase of cattle for suspected slaughter. Beating up couples wishing to get married who are belonging to different communities for suspected love jihad 
is common. Universities with independent traditions of thought and practice are being muzzled, be it the central university in your city or my university, named after our first prime minister, a prime minister who, as you know, is much reviled today. We have been nailed to the cross and passers-by egged on to throw epithets as stones on us, anti-national, seditious, what have you. Silencing of dissenting, dissenting voices, the most recent being the murder of Gauri Lankesh, has shocked the nation. This amounts to suppression of freedom and civil liberties which are essential for a healthy democracy. Let us recall what Gandhiji said in 1939. I quote, he said, civil liberty is the breadth of political and social life. It is the very foundation of freedom. It is the water of life. I have never heard of water being diluted. So typically Gandhi to encapsulate it so well. I have never heard of water being diluted. So what does this say about the present state of our nation? A nation whose foundations seem to be quite sound at not very long ago. It can appear that the civilizational roots of the nation are withering. Prophets of doom, of whom there are many, are quick to predict the breakup of India. In fact, the breakup of India has been predicted right from the Nehruvian era. Here I disagree with these Cassandras of pessimism. And I believe that a perspective of what is called nation in the making could be used to understand what is happening. Now, nation in the making, some of you might know, was a term which was used by Sur Surendranath Banerjee, one of the early nationalist leaders from Bengal. And nation in the making is an ongoing process with unity being consolidated, challenged, and sometimes facing discrimination or disintegration at different points of time. So the unity of the nation is not a given. It's not some idealized Bharat Varsha from the Rig Veda, which we were born with. It's something which we won and we forged in the smithy of the freedom movement. And it's something very importantly that we need to preserve with conscious effort. And here the rule of civil society and the rule of the state is very significant. And when the state does not play its role, then our role becomes even more important. India has been a nation in the making for the last 100 years or so, or rather 150 years or so. The unity of India as a nation is rooted in its diversity. In India, we do not feel threatened by diversity and difference. Regional identities, Linguistic diversities, tribal loyalties, religious affiliations have gone hand in hand with a sense of an all India unity. What is amazing is that autonomy has been given to diverse linguistic and ethnic and tribal groups. And yet this autonomy has strengthened our unity, not taken away from it. Let me give you an example from the 50s. Diversity in the linguistic sphere was recognized and officially patronized by the state during what is called the linguistic reorganization of the states in the 1950s. In fact, this diversity was celebrated and embraced. The wisdom of the nationalist leadership at that time, Nehru and company, in not deciding on a national language. Unlike neighboring country like Pakistan, which as you know had to witness at the consequences of linguistic chauvinism, of pushing Urdu down the throats of the unwilling Bengalis. And look what happened, the country broke up. Sri Lanka too followed a policy of linguistic chauvinism. Again, very unfortunate circumstances. But our national leadership 
what they did was they realized they kept this issue in abeyance for a while and by giving recognition to linguistic groups beginning from andhra you know the story and spreading to punjab they ensured that today we have a situation where english and even hindi have effectively emerged as link languages across the country there's a certain bombaya english which has been propagated by bollywood which i think we all understand and we all know that the hindi serials you know are watched in from mizoram to manipur translated into languages so it's happened as a cultural phenomenon it's not been imposed if it had been imposed there would have been reaction of the kind that we did see in the 50s from tamil nadu and elsewhere let me remind you again that the very idea of india is of relatively recent vintage contrary to the claims made by the hindu communalists there is no reference to a territory called bharat or let alone india even in the rigveda according to grierson who compiled the first linguistic survey of india the term hind from which hindustan comes was a persian term which was used for the people of hind and hind the reference was to a geographical area around the sindhu river and hind was also a reference to the languages which were spoken by the hindis not hindus the hindis the people of hind so all three terms hindi from their hindu and then hindustan had nothing to do with hindu religion the origin comes from hind and hindis it's very important to remember contrast this with savarkar from his tract hindutva where he says the land which extends from the indus to the southern seas is hindustan note not hindustan hindustan there's a difference there's a crucial h which is there which changes the whole meaning the land of the hindus and we hindus savarkar says are the nation that owns it to us he says hindus hindustan and india mean one of the same thing let me remind you my friends that it was a man of turkish mongolian descent you know of him the famous poet amir khusro who proudly proclaimed his hindustani identity he said i am an indian i am a hindustani turk and he was the first to extol the beauty of the land the seasons the languages of the land in a very famous masnavi called nusifir written in the 13th century the process of nation in the making did not begin as often it is claimed as a struggle for freedom from the foreign rule of muslims and christians very often we hear reference to 1000 saal ki gulami and the nation is supposed to be a struggle for freedom from that gulami no my friends that is not the case the freedom was from colonial rule which began with the early nationalists in the late 19th century people like dada bhai naroji and others who exposed colonial exploitation and thus gave legitimacy to the demand for a free india with the coming of gandhi ji the indian people truly came into their own they flocked to the movement in their multitudes filling the prisons swarming to the beaches to make salt picketing foreign shops drawing the attention of the world to the coming together of the people of india more than anything gandhi ji helped the people of india overcome their fear of the britisher his disciple jawaharlal nehru wrote about this very evocatively in the discovery of india in an essay called and then gandhi came 
Some of you young people may have read this in your school textbooks. It always used to be there in the English textbook. And one sentence I quote from there where he says about Gandhi, he said, his coming was like a beam of light that pierced the darkness. With Nehru, the idea of India assumed a shape which it did not have earlier. The idea of Purn Azadi, complete independence, a socialist vision for free India, a land not for the capitalists, but for peasants, for workers, where women would get equality, where there would be adult franchise. In India, we got adult franchise, including for women, without any battle being fought by suffragettes. It came because it was the due of women who had participated in the freedom struggle. This vision of India was reflected in the Karachi Resolution of 1939-31, which had been drafted by Nehru and which was moved in the AICC by Gandhiji. So this conception of a secular democratic nation cut its teeth in the struggle against colonialism. And what's important for us, the process of nation in the making is, that this idea found huge resonance among large numbers of Indians. But there were also some critics, and most of these critics came from the ranks of the communalists. Jinnah and his Muslim League were associated with the demand for Pakistan, and they rested this on what is called the two-nation theory. That is, Hindus and Muslims are not only two communities, but they are two separate nations. We know about this. How many of you know that it was not Jinnah, but V.D. Savarkar, who in his presidential address to the Hindu Mahasabha in 1937, first put forward the two-nation theory. I quote a sentence. He said, India cannot be assumed to be a homogenous nation. On the contrary, there are two nations in the main, Hindus and Muslims in India. This is Savarkar in 1937, friends, before Jinnah came up with the two-nation theory and the Muslim League demand for Pakistan, which is in 1940. Within a decade, very tragically, partition was imposed on us by the British. The Congress could do very little but to regretfully accept partition. Even Gandhiji regretfully accepted partition, though you might remember he had said at one point, I will not let partition happen. It will be over my dead body. Even he recognized that there was nothing he could do at that point. But, and this is very important, the Congress leadership did not accept, when I say Congress leadership, please don't mix it up with the Congress of today. I don't think the Congress of today has, that they are the rightful, uh, you know, uh, flag bearers or they, they can they inherit that legacy of the freedom movement. The freedom movement is my, I own the freedom movement, you own the freedom movement, it is everybody's sacrifices uh, which, has, uh, which have been there. So what does the national leadership do? The national leadership is confronted with a demand and this demand is, I quote a letter which Sardar Patel got from one of the Birla brothers, not GD, but one of from the family. And the letter said, is it not time that we should consider Hindustan as a Hindu state, with Hinduism as a state religion? And significantly, Sardar Patel rejected this outright. He said, the state must exist for all, irrespective of caste, and creed. Yet this demand for a Hindu state continued to be made, particularly after 1947 August. And later on, it got linked with the Hindu Mahasabha giving a call for the murder of Gandhi and Nehru, who were seen as the obstacles to the realization of this Hindu Raj. 
Very sadly, under the present post-2014 regime, we have seen the revival of this demand for a Hindu state. When celebrating the victory of the BJP government, a minister of the state of Goa claimed that it would now be possible to develop India as a Hindu nation. A colleague of his added that India was already a Hindu nation in its culture. These statements have a very sad but uncanny resemblance to the ones made in 1947. In 1947, or rather 1948, January, Gandhi went on a fast unto death to ensure that Muslims were not treated as second-class citizens. Pledges came from Hindu leaders of Delhi. By the end of the month, he was felled by those who had a different idea of India, a Hindu Rashtra in whose creation they saw him as a stumbling block. Sardar Patel, again very interestingly, I quote Sardar Patel for reasons I will explain later, he said, it was a fanatical wing of the Hindu Mahasabha directly under Savarkar that hatched the conspiracy and saw it through. The letters are there in Sardar Patel letters. He was the home minister at that time. It was well known that Nathuram Godse and Narayan Rao Apte, the men who were hanged for his murder, were ardent Savarkarites. But what we sometimes don't know is that though Savarkar was let off, he was part of those who was put up for trial, but he was let off on technical grounds because the case hinged on the testimony given by the approver. And in criminal law, the testimony of an approver is not sufficient for conviction unless it is corroborated by other testimony. And at that time, some other testimony did not come forward. So he was let off. But in the 1960s, when the Jeevanlal Kapoor Commission was set up to investigate into, once again, into Gandhi's murder, by that time, Savarkar was no more. And two of his associates came and testified to his role in Gandhi, in the conspiracy behind Gandhiji's assassination. So he was indicted by the Kapoor Commission. Given this, I think it is utterly a shame that Savarkar's portrait was installed in parliament despite protest and it was placed very significantly right opposite Gandhiji's portrait. Going back to the years right after independence and partition, the early years of independence showed secularism becoming a bedrock of the constitution. Gandhi's martyrdom was a blow which had been dealt by communal forces, but very interestingly and paradoxically, Gandhi's assassination also gave India about 20 years of freedom from communal violence. Why was this? This was because even those who supported the communal organizations, the refugee groups, my father was part of one of them. We came from, you know, my family came from Lahore in 1947, and I grew up in a refugee colony, which, you know, where it was all Jansang and everything around us. And the people who were supporting these organizations were shocked by Gandhi's assassination. They said, no, we don't want this politics to go that far. We didn't want the assassination of the Mahatma. So, as I said, very paradoxically, the first 20 years saw freedom from communal violence and the reduction of communal parties to an insignificant role. And the sad part was that we were lulled into a false sense of complacency. We did not see that though there was no communal violence happening, the first riot in free India was in uh, Jamshedpur around 1967 after 20 years. But we did not realize that communal violence is only the tip of the iceberg. It's communal ideology which permeates at the ground level 
that is where the real danger lay. Beneath the surface, a social transition was taking place. And here the old world and its institutions were withering away and there was a moral and cultural vacuum which got heightened particularly after Nehru's death, which gave space for ideologies like communalism which promote hatred to grow. And by the 80s, communalism was once more on, it was resurgent. The anti-Sikh riots of 84, the destruction of the Babri Masjid, then attendant communal riots, the anti-Muslim pogrom in Gujarat in 1922, 2002. This created an atmosphere in which communal parties made rapid headway, leading to the formation of the first right-wing government in Free India in 1999. By 2014, the electoral and other gains which had been made by the BJP were unimaginable, even to the BJP leaders. Uh, access to state power, according to me, is what has now changed everything. It has emboldened the Hindu communal formation to fabricate a distorted version of their past, particularly their role in the freedom struggle. The communalists, as you may know, were loyalists. They were on the other side of the barricades when the struggle against imperialism was enjoined. Obviously, they do not want to be reminded of their loyalist past. Many of you might know that Savarkar, who is lauded as the great Krantivir Savarkar, the hero of Andamans, I'm not belittling his contribution at all, but let us not forget that he begged forgiveness from the British government in a letter that he wrote in 1913. And he promised lo loyalty to the government, saying, if you release me, I promise undying loyalty to you. Let us also not forget this. I was shocked when I was putting together uh, recently a book of documents on 1947. I had always heard of the Communist Party being on the side of the British in 1942, and that the Communist Party in 1947 had said, azadi hai. this is a false dawn. But I was shocked to come across documents which showed that the Hindu Mahasabha had declared 15th August, our day of freedom, of Azadi, as a day of mourning. It was declared as a day of mourning. Or, Again, I found a document showing a letter that Shama Prashad Mukherjee, the leader of the Hindu Mahasabha, who was a minister in Nehru's cabinet, he was hoisting the Bhagwa Janda on his official residence. And Nehru pointed that out to him and objected. So selective appropriation of nationalist icons is another strategy which is followed by the Hindu communal groups. This again is, as I said, works very well for a group which has espoused loyalism and was not on the side of the people during the national movement. Gandhi, we know, lip service being paid to him. The Congress leader, Vallabhai Patel, as we know, is glorified today as the Iron Man. And he's set up as a counterpoise to the much maligned Nehru. That is partly why all my quotations today were from Sardar Patel. The ones which showed where he said, secularism is, you know, we have, will have a secular state. His pointing out that the Hindu Mahasabha was behind Gandhi's assassination. What will the present government who, you know, they go back to at that time, uh, how will they live with this? A statue of Patel, as you know, is being built in Gujarat term the Statue of Unity, 597 feet high, its parts to be fabricated in Chinese foundries. So much for Make in India. <laughs> Gandhi, unfortunately, has been reduced to a mascot for the government's Swachh Abhiyan, the cleanliness campaign, as his glasses, the logo. Appropriating Gandhi is a travesty 
by a party distinguished by its absence from the annals of the national movement, whose earlier avatars, the Hindu Mahasabha, were directly involved in his assassination. And the Hindu Mahasabha leaders called Gandhi's assassination, I have the document for this, they called it an asurvad, uh, the slaying of a demon, rather than shahadat or martyrdom, which is what we all call it. Now, when we speak of these two visions of the nation, a narrow vision versus an inclusive one, history writing is what generally comes to mind. The battle for the nation is in a way fought over the body of this, uh, it's over the body of history writing that this battle is false. The communal interpretation of history goes back to the colonial period when James Mill and others talked about three periods in Indian history. Hindu period, Muslim period, and then not Christian period, British period. So communal history or Hindutva history followed that using one standard for something and another standard for something else. The pre-British period was seen as a period of decline, period of Muslim rule, 100 years of Golami or 700 years of Golami, depending on who is writing about it. So there is a decadent period of Islamic rule which is then followed by a period of British rule, which is supposed to be great for India. Now, these two perspectives, the communal standpoint and the secular standpoint, as I said, the terrain of the idea of the nation, it is on this terrain that this battle is being waged. And this battle is being waged because people like you and me, we want to have a say in what kind of India we want to live in. What kind of books, textbooks, we want our children to read. Do we want them to read textbooks which are full of communalism, and which is, communalism incidentally is almost like racism, or like anti-Semitism, the kind of ideology which is pushed. Savarkar's idea of India, which he puts forward in Hindutva, has no role for Muslims or Christians. You have to pass the acid test for citizenship by two points, Pitra Bhumi and Punya Bhumi. Are your ancestors from this country? Are your sacred lands, Punya Bhumi, from this country? As you can see by logical argument, certain communities, for whom holy lands will not be in India, are automatically excluded then from being part of this nation. The Panch Janya, the RSS mouthpiece, have, goes and makes shocking racial statements. Tarun Vijay, for example, spoke about how uh, contradicting something, he said, oh, we are very uh, tolerant, we live with these dark South Indians. You may have, you know, come across that impossible statement. So the idea of India is something which, as I said, is much debated and which a certain narrow conception of India is what is being pushed in the history textbooks. The RSS runs thousands of Saraswati Shishu Mandirs and Vidya Bharati schools all over the countries. Every Sunday or on holidays, there are RSS shakhas which are held, again, pushing forward a very pernicious view of history. And the worst part is educating young minds in this. Right. Thank you. Uh, part of this hate project is to portray all communities other than Hindus as foreigners in India. I'll give you one example over here about how ridiculous some of this is. The RSS head, Guru Golwalkar, in a book called We or Our Nationhood Defined, you may have heard of what is called the Aryan race theory, right? And one of this, the theory was, he said, the North Pole 
It was also believed that the Aryans came from the North Pole. So what does Guru Golwalkarji do? He says, the North Pole was originally in India. In the region of today's Bihar and Orissa. And while the Aryans remained in India, the North Pole later zigzagged its way up to the current location. So this is the kind of totally unscientific sort of history that we have found. After the BJP came to power in 2014, there has been a very unfortunate uh, attempt or drive, I should say, to use government institutions and state power to attack scientific and secular history and promote communal historiography through state-sponsored uh, institutions. Now, earlier we used to hear of the Indian History Congress as the main organization for historians. Now we have Akhil Bharatiya Itihas Sankalan Samiti, or we have Shiksha Bachao Andolan Samiti, Shiksha Sanskriti Uthan Nayas, all of which are pushing for Indianizing the education system. Books are opposed. There was an attack by Dinanath Batra on Wendy Doniger's very famous book on the Hindus, the, an alternative history. And I find it very sad that in such a vibrant country like ours, where freedom of speech is respected on the whole, that even the publishers, a very famous publishers, no quarrel with them, but even they were uh, subdued into withdrawing and pulping the book. Uh, the Indian Council for Historical Research, again a very august body, the very big names which were associated with it were removed and reconstituted with members who are distinguished only by their ideological affinity with the RSS. Um, paradoxically or ironically, much of this is done in the name of glorifying the Indian past. Actually, it ends up doing the opposite. Because our past is not about homogeneity. As Amartya Sen, the distinguished Nobel laureate, has pointed out in his book, The Argumentative Indian, and he has said this elsewhere also, he has shown how the even the growth of Vedic mathematics and Vedic science has grown in an atmosphere of intellectual debate and heterodoxy. In fact, he says, it's a tradition of skepticism, meaning always questioning, always looking at what can, asking questions, that it is this tradition of skepticism which was behind our great achievements. Mahatma Gandhi also continued this tradition of skepticism. It is Gandhi Jayanti today. Let me quote a sentence from him. He said, it is no good quoting verses from Manuspriti and other scriptures in defense of orthodoxy. A number of verses in these scriptures are apocryphal. A number of them are meaningless. Again, he said, I exercise my judgment about every scripture, including the Gita. I cannot let a scriptural text supersede my reason. Today, on the 2nd of October, it is perhaps, I think, an appropriate moment to rededicate ourselves to the idea of the Indian nation that Gandhi and the freedom movement stood for that the Mahatma fought and died for, an idea that is enshrined in our constitution. Thank you so much, friends. Thank you, Sucheta Ji. We'll have a few questions, if that's all right with you. Can we have the lights in the auditorium, please? Would you like to sit and take the questions here? More lights in the auditorium? One question here. Can I see more line? Second, second, the man standing there, that's all. Yeah, go ahead. You can take this one. Um, 
while I agree with most of what you've said, I am afraid I find that you've only covered part of the reality. And my question to you is that do you believe that communism exists only in the Hindu community in India? And if we are, and as somebody who truly believes in cultural diversity, in pluralism, in the freedom to practice or not practice any religion, why is it that you did not address anything to do with the communalism which exists in the other communities of India, including the Muslims and the Christians? So I would go on to add that I found your talk very biased and very anti-Hindu. And I say this as a member of a minority community called the Jain community, which is also at a receiving end, because when people talk minority community in India, they forget that there are six to seven communities and not just Muslims. Thank you so much. I completely agree with what you're saying. I plead guilty to uh, giving only a certain slice of reality. Uh, the only thing I could say, I'll, I'll answer it in two parts. The, in my, to explain what I did, um, I believe that, for example, that Hindu communalism, Muslim communalism, minority and majority communalisms are all the same. And I think they feed on each other, they encourage each other, and one cannot have any struggle against, for example, Hindu communalism, if one doesn't equally at the same time take on other communalisms strongly. I have no doubt in my mind about that. As far as, uh, you see, I'm sorry if this came across as some, as a critique of Hindu religion or of the Hindu community. It was, as I said, if there was a bias, it was only that uh, I was talking about comparing the state at the time of independence and the role it played, uh, what I thought was a stellar sort of role, to the role or the absence of, the ro of a role uh, of that kind being played today. So the focus got pitted more on Hindu communal formation because of that. So as I said, if uh, it's purely an accident that that's happening. Now, as far as Hindu religion is concerned, uh, I believe that you know this is something which one learned from Gandhi, that there is nothing intrinsically communal or wrong or whatever with any religion. In fact, at the risk of sounding, I don't know how this will go down, but I think Hinduism Part of the reason why we haven't had uh, rabid sort of Hindu communalism in this country is because Hinduism has essentially been a way of life rather than an organized religion which has tried to restrict, you know, other communities. So I think it is the eclectic uh, nature of the faith, you know, which, which makes it something more than a religion. Uh, which has been important in that. And I think as far as Muslim communalism is concerned, there is no doubt in my mind that, I mean, for example, pre-independence, uh, you know, they were the ones who were clearly behind the partition of the country along with the British. The British were the ones who promoted them. And uh, it's... The, the thing is that when you talk about majority and minority communalism, I think a little more emphasis comes on the majority as happens in every situation. You know, okay? One question from there. Yeah. yeah short, short. I am Siddiqui Azad. Uh, thank you for this wonderful lecture. Making India and Making India, which have two share in my mind. वो जो रिलेट करते हैं इस रिजल्ट को मेकिंग इंडिया अकॉर्डिंग टू रघुपति साय फिराक सरजमीन हिंद पे अकवा आलम के फिराक काफले आकर बसते गए हिंदुस्तान बनता गया 
But animating in India is what Malik Zada Manduri said that in his couplets that Ab to reh reh ke jali lashon ki bu aati hai Ab to reh reh ke jali lashon ki bu aati hai Pahle ta na thi aise apne chaman ki khushbu Madam, I would, I would like to ask you, what will be India's future? Who will rule India? Making elements or unmaking un elements? I don't know who will rule India, but I certainly know that it is you and me who must make our voices felt so that whatever rule there is, is taking the aspirations of the people into account. That's the most important thing. And the persons who will rule India will always be those who will be um, in accordance with Indian tradition. It cannot be some other ideas which can come and rule India. There's no doubt about that. The lady there who stood up. Yeah. And if we can see one hand from behind, I'll take one more question. Yeah, please. Yeah, the mic. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm a practicing Hindu and a very secure one at that. So I will let uh, that comment pass. I want to ask you that a part of our Nehruvian legacy mm -hmm. has been the cultivation of a scientific temper as promoted by the late PM Bhargav. And I personally, uh, in my uh, coming from my generation, see that as a very, very uh, viable option to build a better India. Now, can you please make a comment on this? I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, my talking about a scientific uh, history was also part of that. Um, one of the most uh, I think appalling things has been uh, how professional disciplines like science, for example, have been almost infused or infected with superstition and completely irrational sort of ideas. The whole, I mean, the prime minister going to the science congress and talking about plastic surgery being known in ancient times and talking about, you know, Ganesha being an uh, example of that. Um, I, I could give many other examples. This is something which just came to my mind. But uh, in history also, you see, um, there is an idea of a secular or an a scientific history. The idea, again, being that Everything should be open to reason. It's, and there is today, unfortunately, a whole atmosphere of what I can only call religiosity uh, and a certain kind of strange spirituality, which is not a gendered, which is not a genuine spirituality, but where you have, you know, um, you have babas and sort of saints, etc., ruling the roost. And so people are not, I mean, as a historian, I'm not given the license or that freedom to write the history that I, I, I put together from the documents. Because every person I talk to is a practicing historian. Why? They'll say, oh, we lived through those times. Aap nahi jante, humne to dekha hai, na? Humne to dekha hai, wo to jo, aap to jo kitabon mein padha hai aapne. So this absence of a professional approach, this is part of it. That, that's what I said, that as scientists, at least some of you are, you know, a little... Uh, more sort of uh, um, immune to this kind of a thing because people accept that science is something which is, you know, uh, scientific and has certain rules and you're trained and you're professional, etc. Scientific temper, I think, has taken a huge beating in recent years and at a, at a very popular level also. And that's why I was mentioning the Godmen and the Babas. I mean, I am sometimes surprised by, compared to when we grew up, 
I'm not saying there wasn't faith around us. Faith was personal. Religion meant faith in a personal sense. Today, when we talk about religion, it is about the public and almost naked parade of religion and its organized might. I was so un felt so sad to see the chief minister of UP uh, leading a Dasera parade, um, you know, five days, at least for five years that he has been elected as the chief minister. If you and I have to go on deputation somewhere, if I'm asked to say head a body and leave the university, then surely I, when I take leave and go there, I, there are some rules of that, you know, and I follow that and I, I behave like a chief minister. I, ca I have to stop being a Mahant for five days, five years, you know. But this is what I mean. So when, you know, it's how everything has got so intermeshed, politics, religion, education, History textbooks, you will be surprised to know when the very good history textbooks written by Romila Thapar, Bipin Chandra and others were removed uh, by the earlier government, what was said? They said that religious heads have objected to certain things, that this has hurt the religious sentiments of ex-community. Now, are religious heads going to vet? You know, it's not just history textbooks. Tomorrow, you know, I mean, history, tomorrow scientific books will be vetted by people who don't even believe in, say, the uh, theory of Darwin or evolution. And Christian groups might say, no, we believe in, you know, divine creation, etc. And then, we, you know, why are you teaching the uh, Darwinian evolution for us? So surely we need to safeguard this. So thank you so much for uh, highlighting this and drawing our attention to this. Thank you, but I must disappoint you. We've already overshot 10 minutes into the lunch uh, break. Uh, so Chetaji will be available with us, hopefully, for the next one or two hours. So you can speak to her. Don't go away. I have some very important uh, announcements to make. So Chetaji, thank you very much for this very, very enlightening talk. <laughs>